think it's quiet. Uh, all right, well, it's good to see everybody. It's a beautiful day outside, and we have the great privilege of looking at God's word again. Uh, let's uh, bow our heads, and we'll begin our day going to our God. Almighty God and Father in heaven, uh, we do thank you and praise you for bringing us here. Uh, Lord, there have been events in the past week that could have inhibited us, whether it be physical or mental or spiritual. But Father, we, we praise you that you've enabled us uh, by your power and might to allow us to gather together that we may look to you, that we may look to your word, that we may do so uh, through the, uh, the blood of Jesus Christ, our Savior. Father, we ask that you would make this time valuable to us. Uh, Father, that we would treat it as the true food and drink that we need in this life. Even as Jesus said, man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from his mouth. Father, be with those who are away from us today. We ask, Lord, that you would keep them in their travels, but that you would also, uh, Lord, uh, provide to them a place where they may worship you this day. Be with those, Lord, who are continuing to struggle with illness and physical difficulties. Would you uphold them? Would you bind them up? Would you provide, Father, relief from their physical ailments and difficulty? And Lord, would you visit them in a special way this day? Give to them, Lord, spiritual rest. Uh, Father, we pray that you would uh, be with those who are downcast. We ask, Lord, that you, through your word today, would lift them up. We pray for our pastor and for Jacob and ask, Lord, that you would continue to use them in our midst. Uh, Father, fill them with your spirit and Lord, direct them, uh, Father, as they help us and guide us in worship and study of your word this day. And Lord, give us eyes that see and ears that hear. Father, indeed, even as we are reading here in this book, Father, uh, give us hearts, Lord, Father, that would have your spirit in it and be filled by it. Uh, Lord, we pray your blessing upon our time of worship this morning. And Lord, we ask all of this in Jesus' name, amen. Uh, if you would, turn to Galatians chapter 3 before we go to Hebrews. And I wish I had time to read everything that's present in the book of Galatians that I think is uh, not exactly the same, but very relevant to what we're discussing and have been discussing in the book of Hebrews, but particularly right now in chapters 7 and 8 and onward. And I'm going to start at verse 3, and I am, gonna, I am just going to read uh, the first nine verses. There is more that Paul writes here that I think is relevant, but for the sake of time, I'll just read the first nine verses. Galatians chapter three, verse one, thank you. Sometimes I don't make that clear, I realize. God's word to us, chapter three, verse one. O foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you? It was before your eyes that Jesus was publicly portrayed as crucified. Let me ask you only this. Did you receive the spirit by works of the law? or by hearing with faith. Are you so foolish? Having begun by the Spirit, are you now being perfected by the flesh? Did you suffer so many things in vain, if indeed it was in vain? Does he who supply the Spirit to you, supplies the Spirit to you, and works miracles among you do so by works of the law, or by hearing with faith? just as Abraham, Abraham excuse me, believed God, and it was counted to him as righteousness. Know then that it is those of faith who are the sons of Abraham. And the scripture foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles by faith, preached the gospel beforehand to Abraham, saying, in you shall all the nations be blessed. So then, those who are of faith are blessed along with Abraham, the man of faith. And then if you would, just turn over to Hebrews chapter 8. And I'm going to start reading at verse 8, and I'll read through the end of the chapter, verse 13. 
chapter 8, Hebrews, starting at verse 8. And I suddenly realized I may not have quieted my phone down, so pardon me. Verse 8. For he, that is God, finds fault with them when he says, Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will establish a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. Not like the covenant I made with their fathers on the day when I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt. For they did not continue in my covenant. And so I showed no concern for them, declares the Lord. For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, declares the Lord. I will put my laws into their minds and write them on their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. And they shall not teach each one his neighbor and each one his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me, from the least of them to the greatest. For I will be merciful toward their iniquities, and I will remember their sins no more. And speaking of a new covenant, he makes the first one obsolete. And what is becoming obsolete and growing old is ready to vanish away. Amen. All right. So just as a quick review, remember that uh, the idea starting in verse 8 is this idea that he's sort of taking this argument in a similar fashion that he took uh, some of the argument in chapter 7. We made that looking particularly at verse 7 both last week and two weeks ago. Uh, and remember that the fault, we, we spent a lot of time last week talking about, notice that the fault he finds is not in what he said, not in what he did, but the fault is found with the people because they're unable. And we, we had a lengthy discussion about this, okay? Um, uh, there's no fault with God, it is the people. Because if there's a fault with the covenant, then obviously that argument can be taken further that there's some fault uh, with God. Um, we talked about the background of the giving of this promise, right? And we are talking about how this was just before Judah was being taken into captivity, uh, uh, before, uh, into Babylon, excuse me. And... Uh, not only were the people faced with you know, the, the attack of the Babylonian Empire, Jeremiah himself was in a pretty low condition. And it was at this time in Jeremiah 31 that God gives this promise, um, this promise of, of a Messiah indirectly, the promise of life, uh, the promise of an eternal everlasting kingdom, a promise that people would live in blessedness and in prosperity. Um, we talked about, remember we talked about that in this opening statement in verse 8, he talks about making this new covenant with the people of Israel and the people of Judah. And we talked about how interesting it is that he would say that in Jeremiah, seeing that the people of Israel had already been taken into captivity by the Assyrians. And were, as we discussed in, in Assyria, those people were mixed into the culture and what became in the New Testament the Samaritan people. Or as the Jews referred to them in common language, we've heard half-breeds. They were not fully Jews, uh, but, but rather a, a compromise, so to speak, uh, that people that held on to the, the direct lineage in terms of physical line. Okay, and so we talked about that, and I, I, won't, I won't go into that. Um, we know that in the New Testament, Judah and the Samaritans were seriously divided. Uh, the Jews looked down upon the Samaritan people very horribly, uh, even mistreated them uh, when they were in their midst. And, of course, we can go to uh, Jesus' parable of, I'll just say it this way, the Good Samaritan. And the description that Jesus gives us there is quite interesting. Um, we talked about uh, these divisions. Part of what's being addressed here in this opening line is that divisions between different lineages will be ended. And I gave you some references, but this idea, we just read this uh, in uh, Galatians chapter 3, where there is no longer Jew or Greek. Paul also talks about this. 
in Romans talking about the difference between Jew, Greek, slave, free, and so on. And so we, we mentioned that last week. I don't want to dig too deep into that again. Verse 9, we also talked about where what he's doing in verse 9 is the writer of Hebrews is going to contrast the new covenant with the old covenant beginning kind of in a negative fashion. There are a lot of differences, right? We talked about the administration of the covenants, one under the imperfect priesthood, uh, one that will be under the second one. Uh, the one that he will write on the hearts will be under the perfect priesthood of Jesus Christ. We talked about how the first covenant is primarily external and the, uh, the new covenant is one that is internal and spiritual. Uh, we talked about the comparison between the first one was restricted to the people, physical line of Abraham, uh, Jacob, his sons, the, the, what we would say the line of the Jews, whereas the new covenant is, if I may use a term we use a lot today, it's global, right? Uh, we talked about how God's love was made, no, made known in the Old Testament under the covenant made at Sinai versus this new covenant. And of course, uh, we talked about this idea of distance, cloudiness, veiled, shadow, unclear, whereas in this new covenant, it's going to be uh, very clear. We, see, we talked about the differences in God's grace uh, portrayed in uh, Old Testament versus New Testament. Um, access to God, um, talking about the access that the Old Testament people under the Old Testament covenant at Sinai had limited, if, if we can say even that, limited access to God, whereas now uh, we have this access to boldly approach God through Christ, to boldly go to his throne. Um, so, verse 10, which we were starting to dig into, let me reread it. Uh, for this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, declares the Lord. I will put my laws into their minds and write them on their hearts. I will be their God, and they will be uh, my people. Uh, this is indirectly, although you notice in this verse, God does not say or use the term of his son or God the son Jesus here. Uh, this, is, uh, who, this is implied that the administration of this new covenant is going to be by Jesus Christ, who is the better mediator and guarantor of the covenant. And even that was said, uh, you know, we know that that was even said, what, in chapter 7, verse 22. This makes Jesus uh, the guarantor of a better covenant uh, when he was talking about this comparison between the Old Testament priesthood, and the New Testament. Um, it's a promise made to Jeremiah, okay, uh, as they, to, the, to these people that were nearing exile. And we know that the idea about God's promises, and this is, this is something that should apply to us, we should not ever doubt the promises that God makes in his word. Why? We should never wonder if God will do what he promises to do. I know that seems like a weird question, but I'm going to go ahead and ask it anyways. Everybody's looking at me like... I said, why do we doubt God's promises? Why do we... Why would we doubt? I'm not saying that... I'm not trying to say that you guys are doubting God's promises today, but there are times in our life where we, we wonder, where we doubt, where we're not feeling assured. And my question is, is we should always not fall into that path. We should always not consider God's promises to be somehow not fulfilled or not being done or he won't do it or you're not sure if he's doing it in your life. Why? Maybe I'm not asking this right. He will never leave us or forsake yeah, I mean, it's that simple. God's promises are yea and amen. We have a history in the Bible of God doing what? Keeping every single promise he makes. And those promises are, hang on, Chuck, those promises are made, 
in and through the perfect mediator and high priest, Jesus Christ, who, who has done everything not only perfectly, but completely. So go ahead, Chuck. Yeah, it is hard. It is our sinful nature to go the opposite direction. And I'm just trying to give you a word of encouragement. God's promises to us, it's not a question mark. It's not a percentage that maybe 90% of his promises he might keep in my life. No, no. God's promises are always going to be kept in all of his people's lives because of the work of Jesus Christ. They will be completed. That's our joy. The journey may be hard, but we already know the destination, correct? It may be hard to get out of bed someday. There, there may be a relationship that uh, brings tears to your eyes. There may be physical pain that seems insurmountable, but the end result is already written. That's the point here. The point in this new covenant, because anybody notice how the speech here? It, it always strikes me, okay? Uh, if you look at verse 10 and you read to the end, how many personal time, how many personal pronouns are used? Verse 10, for this is the covenant I will make with the house of Israel after those days. I will put my laws in their minds. Uh, he goes, I will be their God. They shall be my people, right? I will be merciful. I will remember their sins no more. That should strike everyone. And think about it. This was given to the time in Jeremiah. And I, I know that Jeremiah, you know, reading the book of Jeremiah can even be in some ways a little bit of a downer. I mean, Jeremiah's life was pretty difficult. He was asked to do some pretty horrific things, even physically. Lie on this side for a certain number of days, lie on your other side for a certain... I mean, it was a pretty crazy life that God called Jeremiah to do. And so we see that Jeremiah was at times downcast, and, and we too suffer that, but I'm, I'm just trying to... It strikes me that so many places in Scripture, there is this, this, this kind of language about what, what God does for his people, period. It's a beautiful thing. Right? No matter where we end up, no matter what difficulties we experience, no matter where we are in life, being his means we reach the final destination. And that's a wonderful thing. And that's what he's, that's what he's talking about. That's the main difference was the old covenant did not have that destination. As we read in Galatians this morning, the old covenant ended in defeat. You had your hand up. Okay, good question. Anybody want to try to answer it? What does he mean by after those days? So look at, uh, I'm going to go forward. Look at Hebrews chapter 9, verse 10. Um, it, it's just uh, simply kind of similar to something else that's used. So notice in verse 10 it says, hmm, Never mind, that's not the right verse I wrote down. That doesn't work. Yeah, uh, hang on a second. Yeah, I'm going to have to find that for you. So that's not, the, I wrote down the wrong verse, so let me, let me work on that. But here's the thing. Uh, he also uses a term, in the fullness of time. So what does that mean? After, after all of this time goes by and... Time being all of that time living under the law, when the fullness of time is when basically he does what? Brings it to completion through the incarnation of Jesus Christ. And so this is, this is the same phrase. On that day, basically, you know, um, he, he, you know, it's the comparison on that day represents the time he did what? Made that old covenant with Moses and the people of Israel at Sinai. But after those days means after the completion and the fullness of time, he's going to do what? He's going to make that new covenant. And he does so by the coming of Christ in his incarnation, his obedience, his suffering, his death, his resurrection, his ascension. Any other questions, comments? Yes. Yes. 
Uh, I'm not prepared to answer that question right now. I'm not prepared to answer that question right now. <laughs> um, uh, I, I, think, I think the picture here, I'm not sure, and Jacob can jump, jump in if he wants to, because again, uh, my training is strictly by what I read, and nobody talks about that, because I notice the same thing. Nobody brings that up in the books I'm reading, but my comment would be this, is the picture between Yahweh in the Old Testament and and who he's working through, and I may be stretching that a bit, but I, I, that would be my off the cuff, and I hate doing things off the cuff, but yes, there's a difference, okay? And, and if you go back and you compare line for line, the passage in Jeremiah 31, and then you look how it's quoted here, there are some changes. And that's very, that's, that's not unusual for Old Testament passages being quoted in the New Testament, that you will see some, some, some differences in the words that are used. And I'm, I think I'll stop there, but uh, I don't know, Jacob, do you have anything to offer? Just a few thoughts off the top of my head. Go ahead. Occasionally, I mean, sometimes they're, I, I'd have to look at the specific instance, but they're, they're um, quoting from the Greek Septuagint instead of the Hebrew. Sometimes that accounts for some slight dip variations. Um, but also, I would say under inspiration of the Holy Spirit, like, the New Testament authors are able to draw truths from the Old Testament that might not hermeneutically be safe for us to try to do similar things, but under the inspiration of the Spirit, they are they're gathering truth from that that we wouldn't be able to gather ourselves. Very good. Okay, very good. Thanks, Pat. Thanks, Jacob. Anybody else? All right. So let's let's go on. Um, um, under the New Covenant, all are kept infallibly. This is a quote from John Owen's book, uh, Work on Hebrews. I, I, I love that quote. I mean, I, I've kind of already said this, but I just you notice it took me about five minutes to say it all, and he says it beautifully in one sentence. All are kept infallibly. And that's, that's the idea here on the, the New Covenant. I think it's a beautiful picture of what God's talking about, is that the Old Covenant could not keep because we know that the Old Covenant couldn't do what? The Old Covenant couldn't save. It was just to be shadow and type of what was to come. The New Covenant does what? It, it's going to establish peace. There is the demonstration of God's love to his people, but there is the true return of love of people to God. Um, one commentator says, there's a picture here of mutual, uh, of mutual love. I thought it was an interesting comment, but what he's referring to here is he's going a little bit further than 10, but down below where it says, um, I will be, you know, where it says, I will be their God at the end of verse 10, and they shall be my people. There's this implication of how God is going to love us, right? We see this, by the way, and if, I was thinking about reading from Hosea, but if you haven't read the book of Hosea recently, read it again. It's a beautiful passage of, God loving an adulterous people. And, and, and how it says that once they, were, once they were a people with no name, but now there'll be a people with what? My name upon them. Another sample of what? When, we, when somebody adopts a child, what does he do? He puts his name upon him, a demonstration of his love, his care, his concern, but also his name means he's entitled to what? He's not just a person of the family, but he's a son or a daughter of that family, entitled to all the privileges that come with that name. Okay, so again, some beautiful stuff. Mutual love. Um, uh, you know, the people are forever in a right relationship with God and... And, and, and so we'll say, you know, this, this covenant is so excellent. And remember, we talked about this last week, but remember the way God is doing this when he says, I will put my laws in their mouth, I will write them on their hearts, I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Verse 10, remember that this is the covenant that God made with Jesus before the foundation of the world. So again, the mediator, the covenant that's made between God and God the Son, God the Father and God the Son is powerful here. And, and why would anyone object to the replacement of the old? Uh, it's an interesting phrase. Again, I'm using something I read from a commentator. Why would, they, why would these people, 
I don't know if you guys are starting to think how crazy these people were for wanting to go backwards. Now, I, I understand it. I don't, want to be, I don't want to belittle persecution, having goods taken, people are being imprisoned. Paul speaks of it again in, in Galatians 3, uh, where we talked about it. But if you want a comparison, go to 1 Thessalonians. What's the comparison between the Galatians and the Thessalonians? Anybody? It's an interesting comparison. The Thess were the Thessalonians persecuted? Very much so. Paul upholds them. In fact, uh, in some of my reading in 1 Thessalonians, the people in Thessalonica are the only people that Paul holds up as being an example to all the churches. And they experienced the same thing. They accepted Christ by faith, and what happened was is they were persecuted heavily. Now, now I want to be careful. I, I'm jumping out of the Jewish discussion a little bit, but, but the idea in Thessalonians is, is that these people were badly persecuted, but they pressed on. They pressed on, they pressed on, they pressed on. They didn't do what? They didn't surrender or give up their faith but rather grew in their faith and not only shared it with Paul, but he talks about how they shared it with all the other churches in the area in Macedonia. Thessalonica, the church of Thessalonica was an example to many churches throughout the region. So it's a very interesting comparison. The Galatians are doing some of the same thing that the Hebrews, that's being talked about in the book of the Hebrews. So, um, one just side comment, it's not super important, but it's interesting to note that both of these covenants, old and new, were gradually established. So if we think about the old covenant, it didn't just, you know, the people of Israel just didn't sort of instantly end up where, they didn't end up at Sinai. Think about it. Moses is sent, right? Moses is adopted by the house of Pharaoh. Moses flees the house of Pharaoh. Moses goes and lives in the desert, encounters God at the burning bush. God then does what? Calls him to go and what? Call a people out. We have the journey, uh, you know, we have the 10 plagues, the journey out of Egypt, the crossing of the Red Sea, and then we have this establishing of this covenant. Well, in the New Testament, similarly, although it's been, although it has been predicted in the Old Testament, the physical way in which it comes. Think about it. Christ is born, but we have the ministry of John the Baptist announcing or beginning the work or going before Jesus. Uh, we, we have his ministry, his suffering and death. We have his trial, his crucifixion, his resurrection, and ultimately his ascension. And so we just want to make a covenant, we just want to make a comment, excuse me, that that we see the unveiling of this co uh, covenant, both old and new, in steps. Um, um, is there a difference between the grace and mercy God offers in the Old Covenant and in the New Covenant different? That's a question I have for you guys. I will repeat it. Is there a difference in the grace and mercy offered by God to those under both the Old Testament and the New Testament. Hand up where? I'm sorry, your hand right is right in where the sun's reflecting off the concrete. Can't see it at all. In fact, I can't see anything right now because I'm getting the reflection of the sun. Go ahead. And, and it's an excellent answer, right? It's an excellent answer because that's indeed the whole premise of God's grace and mercy in the Old Testament under the covenant of works is what? Do this and you will live. If you don't do it, what happens? Under, under the covenant that's being spoken of, and he's saying, I'll put a, you know, this new covenant, think about it, faith in the perfect work of Christ. And again, every time I, 
I, I study this section of scripture, I think of Jesus' own comment about himself. Come to me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, do what? Come, rest in me because my yoke is easy and my burden is light. And, and, and the picture is, is by faith is the requirement of the new covenant. And by the way, we don't even muster if I may use that term, we don't even muster what? Our faith, correct? It is, we're, we're, called to, we're called to nurture it, we're called to read God's word, we're called to pray, we're called to uh, fellowship together, to sit under the preaching of the word, but it's so interesting that we gotta be careful that that, that little thing, well, you know, I have faith in Jesus Christ. That is true, but we always wanna remember that who gave us this faith? Because I didn't go looking for it. I was raised in a godly home most of my life, but I gotta confess, it wasn't until my 20s that uh, God made me see, because it wasn't me, I was going the opposite direction. Go ahead, Peter. I hadn't gotten that far yet, but that's correct, Peter. There's no difference in the grace and mercy of God, but under the old administration, the old covenant, it is impossible for the people to do what? To, to reach that grace and mercy completely. Under the new administration, the new covenant, the new economical situation, if we want to call it that, what can we say? We can say that now it's attainable not because of anything we do, but because of the new covenant being what? The work of God the Father with God the Son. And that's the beauty of it, because the minute you interject us into it, we just foul it all up. So go ahead, Jacob. But we would still want to say that even in, in that administration, it was still attainable because of the Abrahamic covenant. And yes. So by faith, still we're justified. I mean, even, even under the Mosaic covenant, there are people being justified by faith. Yes, there are. I'm not denying that. So. I, I do not. Yeah, I, I get it. It gets confusing. It gets confusing after a while when we start to throw covenants around. So remember, the covenant we're talking about is at made at Mount Sinai, right? So the covenant of grace. By the way, let's just review real quick. Where was the covenant of grace instituted? Covenant of grace instituted. Yeah, I mean it's actually we see it not just in what God says to Adam and Eve, right? But what else do we see it? We see it physically in what God does for Adam and Eve. What does he do for them? He covers them. We had this discussion on the way to church today. Cheryl's, Cheryl's working in Genesis chapter 3 and 4 today in Sunday school, and we were talking about some of the beauty of that because, uh, uh, you know, God, they didn't go, you know, Adam and Eve didn't go to God to get covered. What did they do? They fled and hid. And God doesn't, God does what? He provides, he provides the skin that covers them, which is a picture of what? It's the picture of what Christ will ultimately do in all completion. So I appreciate the comment, Jacob, thanks. But it does get, it does get confusing if, you don't, if we don't keep it straight, and sometimes I might not be doing that well up here. All right, so uh, go ahead. Very good, and yeah, I'm not gonna try to improve upon the writers of the confession. <laughs> Very good, thank you for reading it. It, it. It's a great statement. All right, let's move on. Uh, let's go to, uh, let's go to verse, let's move on to verse 11, unless there's any other questions. Yes, go ahead, please. 
second. It's, if I'm not mistaken, that's a pretty, let me, if I may go to, yeah, it helps if you turn the right way in the Bible. It's not back there at Revelation, that's for sure. Okay, so again, winging it, which is dangerous with God's word. Um, what he's talking about here is he's talking about, he's making this comparison about, um, about the Jews. Um, you know, verse 12, for all who have sinned without the law will also perish without the law, and all who have sinned under the law will also be judged by the law. And he, he's really talking, you know, notice uh, the Gentiles, in verse 14, for when Gentiles do not have the law by nature, but by nature do what the law requires. They are a law to themselves, even though they do not have the law. They show that the work of the law is written on their hearts, while their conscience also bears witness, and their conflicting thoughts accuse or even excuse them on that day when, according to my gospel, God judges the secrets of men by Christ Jesus. Um, I want to be careful here. Uh, I need to look at it more, and I can do so this coming week. My comment would be is that what's being discussed here in Hebrews is uh, different than what's being discussed in Romans chapter 2. Uh, it, it is a, there's a discussion that begins in Romans chapter 2, uh, particularly as he addresses the Jews about the benefits of the law, but he's starting to make this comparison about the Gentiles who have no law, so to speak, but do what is right, whereas those that have the law and aren't saved. He's leading up to something that I, I, I can't explore here, but I don't, I don't think it's the same thing because here... I'm, um, yeah, I think here, to be quite honest with you, I think right here when in, in, in verse 10 he says, I will put my laws in their hearts and write uh, in their minds and write them on their hearts. This is the act of saving faith. And I believe that wholeheartedly because this is the activity of God and this is not illegal. This is not trying to make these people better at keeping the Old Testament law because it's a new covenant, what he's talking about is, is this, will be a, this will be something that the old covenant made at, at Sinai cannot do for these people. Peter. Let me, let me let me try to let me try to let me try to expand on this just a little bit. So so I, I think you're on the right track. We we have to always think about how how the word law is being used. Okay, um, and, and this is not if it's a new covenant here that he's talking about. He's talking about how for this covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days declares the Lord. I will put my laws in their minds and write them on their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people, right? In other words, think about, first of all, internal versus external. The Old Testament law given at Sinai was primarily an external type of operation, and what do we know about it? It could never save. You know, 
the, the, the blood of lambs and goats was never going to be able to do what? To cause God to remember. Remember at the very last phrase here in this passage quoted, I will remember their sins no more. I will, and before that, I will be merciful towards their iniquities. The law in the Old Testament could never, ever what? Have, could never put us in a position for God where he could overlook what? Our iniquities and our sin. So, so what's the law? Let's ask this question. What's the law that's being written on our hearts and minds? Yeah. Yeah, in this passage, what's he, I, I'm getting to this. I, I know I haven't talked about it yet, and so, so we're, we're, it's, a, it's a pretty good progression, so to speak. But when it says, I'll put my laws in their minds and write them on the tablet of their hearts, what's, what is he talking about when he says, my laws? Is he talking about the Ten Commandments? So are you, are you sort of making, leading to like the distinction of like the ritual use of the law? Like no, I, I'm not even going there. Yeah. The, yes, yes. I, I'm, not nega- I'm not negating what the use of the Old no, Testament laws. You're, you're making a distinction there of, of what you're leading to is we may be thinking it of the law um, in driving us to Christ versus the law for the Christian is not one that saves us, but is that is the delight of our heart is in obedience to the law. Okay. All right. Yeah. yeah and yeah, yeah but even more than, even simpler than that. What he's talking about is what is he going to write upon our hearts? He's going to write upon our hearts that only through faith in Jesus Christ are you saved. Because under the umbrella of Jesus Christ is what? It is the keeping of the law perfectly. It is the sacrifice that he makes of himself that is unblemished and perfect. It, it, it is about him being tempted as every, as he's been tempted like all men, but yet without sin, Right? And, and he dies for us, and in dying for us and placing faith in it, that is a new law that's being written on our hearts. It's no longer tied to what? The, the sacrifices that have to be made at the altar and have to be made repetitively and have to be made by what? Repetitive men because they don't live long enough and have to be made external to the true holy place of God. Chuck? Yes, and I, and, and I don't want to say that's exactly what's being referred to here, but it's the gist. In other words, think about what it says afterwards. It says, and they shall not teach each one his neighbor and each one his brother, saying, know the Lord, for they shall all know me. So when you watch, a, I, I'm going to do something that's going to sound like I'm going bizarre and off the tracks here. But when you watch an 11-year-old or a 10-year-old or a 9-year-old confess his faith in Jesus Christ, is that not an amazing thing? Uh, I've had the privilege of doing that, and it's, it's beautiful, right? It's beautiful to see a child confess his faith in Jesus Christ. And there's the law written. That's what God's talking about right here. It cannot be revealed to us in any other way. It's not about, it, yes, I, I, yeah, I mean, Ryan, your comment about the use of the Old Testament law today, we've talked about that many times, and, but that's not what's being talked about here. What's being talked about is how do we become God's people? How is it that we will know God? And that is only through what he's been going through, which is what? The work of Christ the sacrifice of Christ, the sacrifice made in a holy place and made what? Permanently, effectively, forever for God's people. Now, did you have more comments, Peter? 
section of, of the law. Okay, I, <clears throat> maybe I have it. I, I think I know maybe how to, I think, and this, is a, this may be a big leap in my own mind. Is the covenant of works still intact today? Yes or no? Yes. yes. When God made Adam and Eve, they were made to not only work, but to work obediently in service to God, right? To obey him, to do what he required them to do. Now, when Adam and Eve fell, and therefore all mankind, did the covenant of works cease to exist? And the answer is absolutely not. That's the, that's the reason that we need the covenant of grace. But the covenant of works is, is not ended. And so who comes to fulfill and to meet the covenant of works? That is the second Adam, right? The second Adam is who? Jesus Christ. Because what can Jesus Christ do? I did not come to abolish the law, but I came to fulfill it every crossing of the T, every dotting of the I, every jot and tittle, right? So, so now, what I believe is being said here, just very simply, is that when it says, my laws will be in their minds and write them on their hearts, is that they will be a people, not a perfect people, but they will be a people who know me because of the work of Jesus Christ, because of the salvation that is theirs, because of his work. And you've got to remember the bigger context. These people want to go back to the old system. They want to go back to the old ways. So this law that's being written is not, a, it, it's not anything new, but rather it is the salvation that God has promised since the fall of Adam and Eve that is brought to completion in the obedient work, the death, uh, the sacrifice on the cross of Jesus Christ. And that's what I believe that this, what this means, this law that's going to be on their hearts and in their minds. So I think it's a little bit different than what Paul's addressing in Romans chapter 2. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to go this week and I'm going to pull up Romans chapter 2 and try to get a little bit more concrete. Because there's no doubt, folks, that when we start talking about covenants, this gets, this. if you don't understand where we are at with all the, the covenant that's being talked about here is, first of all, what? The covenant made at Sinai. This is the giving of the law. This is not the covenant of works nor the covenant of grace that he's saying he's going to replace. Okay, so I, any other questions or comments? I'm out of time. It's 10 till. Once again, I thought, well, hey, I'll get to start chapter 9 next week. No, not yet. That's okay. I'm just always funny about how that goes. Any other questions or comments? Please feel free to make them now. We, we have a few, maybe a minute. Yeah. Yeah, I'm struggling with the comment that the old covenant cannot save because that's what Okay, so I really, I know one thing, I know that right, Bruce is looking up here going, come on, John, you got to quit. You know, it's time for church. No, no, I'm teasing Bruce. Uh, <laughs> Roman, Galatians chapter 3, verse 10 says, For all who rely on the works of the law are under a curse, for it is written, Cursed be everyone who does not abide by all things written in the book of the law and do them. Absolutely, and that's, that's true today. It is true today. No, no argument. Uh, but again, the, the essence of the covenant, which is salvation through faith, is still the same whether it be today or under the old days. Absolutely. So again, again, let's not muddy the waters. Uh, and, and that's why I want to be careful. The new covenant that's being discussed here in, Romans, in uh, Hebrews chapter 8 is... The covenant made at Sinai, which is the covenant of all of the laws that God gave to Moses and the details around it, and God said, you need to keep these perfectly. What's the problem? Is it the law? And I agree with you. Can I mean, there's nothing wrong with the law. What's wrong is the people who are asked to keep the law. They are fallen. Uh, 
And so in other words, they can't fulfill this Old Testament law correctly. So what does God have to do? God has to do something different. And so the promise in Jeremiah is the promise of a new high priest who can keep the law but also permits God to do what? Permits God to now write it on their hearts so that they know him. And let me, I'm, I'm now eight minutes to the top of the hour. Let's stop and let me do a little bit more digging. And I didn't expect this today, but it's great that it came up now as opposed to later. Let's do a little bit more work, and I'm going to do a little bit of research this week, and we're going to discuss this further next week when we come back, okay? Great, great questions, and I appreciate them. And if it's my fault for confusing you, I want to correct that, and I also want to do some more explanation. So let's uh, bow our heads and give thanks, and we'll move on. Father in heaven, thank you for this day. Thank you for your word, and Lord, help us uh, in the coming weeks to further explore uh, what's being said here from Jeremiah. Uh, Father, help us to uh, better understand the work of Jesus Christ when it comes to the law and to what's being written upon our hearts. And Father, now help us. Help us to worship you. Help us to bow before you. Help us to give you the glory that is due your name. In Jesus Christ, we ask. Amen. I was having fun with you, Bruce, so...